Well, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I want to welcome you again to the Gussie's Gut Show. And uh, let me bring on my partner at gussiesgut.com, Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, everybody out there from down under. Great to be here. Yes, good morning. And uh, we're going to be bringing on uh, Dr. Michael Dim, uh, VDM, but that is the same as DVM. But if you go to U of Penn, where he went, amazing school, they give you VDM. So just lest anybody has any questions in the title, it's not a typo. That's, you know, he's a veterinary med medical doctor. When you said and, that, Rob, it sounds like a disease. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a great school. I, I don't know what they, you know, they just want to be different. Well, I think it's a great disease being a vet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, uh, without any further ado, an amazing veterinarian uh, out of our uh, beautiful state of Florida, um, went to Cornell, uh, finished his uh, doctorate in veterinary medicine at U of Penn, uh, studied under Pitt Karn in homeopathy, and uh, just a really great guy that I've come to know. And I, I hope you all enjoy the show today. Dr. Michael Dim. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Nice to be here. Right. Good Welcome, to indeed. Involved. Great nice to see you. Here. Yep. Good to be here. Great to have you. Well, let's hop right into it. So one of the things we're trying to do is get away from origin stories, how you got how you got there, because there's probably plenty of that on, on the web uh, about, you know, what what got you to today? I want to hop into some of the topics that you're most interested in talking about. So, let's just talk a little bit about the type of medicine you're practicing and what you're the most interested in and why. Well, I am a, a holistic veterinarian who uses all sorts of natural therapies in my holistic practice, from nutritional therapies to herbal therapies. Uh, my passion is more homeopathy, where, as you mentioned, I studied under Dr. Richard Pitcairn starting back in 1998 and been taking continuing education courses with him ever since. And, you know, now what's known as the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy. So I, you know, stay, try to stay current in those various areas, as well as obviously conventional veterinary medicine. And that's what I bring to my to my practice. I, I'm actually fascinated by homeopathy, Dr. Michael. Um, it's an area that I've never used. It's an area that is slammed by a lot of conventional veterinarians who claim it doesn't work. And yet people like yourself, smart people, well-educated people use it, use it effectively. So I'll be really interested as we talk this morning to hear some of the case studies that you've worked with and using homeopathy. Well, I mean, it's a it's a powerful system of medicine. Um, it's based upon the principles of like cures like, um, where we see patients that present with various symptoms and of pathology, and we match the homeopathic remedy to those patients' symptoms in stimulating the body's ability to restore health and balance and and health, you know, so. I'll, I'll, I'm going to press you a little bit more on some examples as we go through, because I'm yeah. really fascinated by this system of medicine, which to me was an enormous learning curve, uh, one which my brain was just was not um, able to comprehend or, or manage, I guess. Right, right. Well, well I'll, I'll... yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. No, I want you to go first. Um, well, you know, as I said, it's a it's a very, you know, it's it's a different idea of, of disease and pathology where we look at illness on a symptom level. In other words, the patient's individual symptoms on a mental, emotional and physical level are what we call the language of disease. And then we, as I said, match a homeopathic remedy to address that symptom totality of the patient. And Samuel. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, hey, this is Rob Ryan, founder of Gussie's Gut. There are two opportunities I'd like to share with you. Number one, if you're enjoying this video right now, wait until you see the ones we have coming up.
I invite you to subscribe right now to our YouTube channel right here below. And number two, if you'd like your dog to have a delicious sample of fermented superfoods that was developed with Dr. Ian Billinghurst, that you sprinkle on top of their food and support their healthy gut, healthy aging, and cover the gaps in their nutrition, then I'm inviting you right now to go to gussiesgut.com forward slash sample. So just hit the pause button here on this video, subscribe, and then visit the website. Thanks for watching. Back to the show. The biggest thing that comes to mind, and thank you for that, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but my brain doesn't remember things either um, to ask later. But this is a system of medicine that is not open to being investigated by our current techniques of science, where we use double-blinded, where we use the right. same system of treatment for half well probably a thousand patients and see the results so this is not amenable to being tested is it in that no sense. it's not no it's not because you know with our conventional model of disease as you said the double blind placebo controlled study um, those are set under very specific conditions and it doesn't look at each patient as an individual really it, and with homeopathy each patient's symptoms are a unique picture that yeah. the remedy or the medicine tries to address. And with Western, you know, studies, it's basically the same system of medicine for everybody. And it either yeah. works or it doesn't work. Yeah. And, and really, isn't this the essence of true healing medicine where you look at the patient as an individual? So important. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, as I said, there's, it's, for example, if you look at a, a skin allergy case that comes in, I mean, everybody's used to that. It's a common presentation, especially here in Florida, where you have an animal that comes in and is chewing its feet or itching or getting hot spots or ear infections. And all those patients, just to give as an example, in the Western model of medicine are treated the same. They're all treated with the same class of drugs, the same class of medications, whereas each patient that comes into the homeopathic veterinarian, uh, we look at not just the skin and ear symptoms, but the whole symptom totality of the patient and their symptom tendencies over their whole life, not just what's presenting in front of us. And um, that's what goes into a homeopathic remedy prescription is that whole chronology of symptoms that a patient presents with from the time they're a puppy or kitten up until they're presenting to you in the, in the convention, in the homeopathic clinic. I'm going to ask one more question. This is that I'm going to turn back to Rob, and this is this is rather esoteric in a sense. I think, from a purely scientific point of view, homeopathy would have to be to, to do with the science of extreme dilution and what happens there. It's, it's, so it's a physical science. Are you aware of any studies in that area? Um, I don't have any off the top of my head. They're, they're there. I mean, there are plenty of homeopathic um, studies in the literature. Um, it's, it's an energy system of medicine. In other words, it operates at the level, if you think about science, it operates at the physics level in the patient. That's, okay. that's what I'm asking, really. Is there much physics sci uh, research into, this, into the physics of dilution? Uh, yes, there, yes, there is. I, I don't have those studies right handy with me today, but there are. Yes. Yeah. So people actually look into this at the deeply scientific level, but our modern um, veterinarian wouldn't even be aware of that, would they? No, they're not. Um, it's kind of like in, in medical school and in the in the in the uh, in the media, you know, homeopathy is is slammed because it's it's not based upon pharmaceuticals and it's not a profit driven uh, system of medicine like Western medicine is. And so there's a brainwashing that occurs to, to young doctors and young veterinarians in training that homeopathy is, as I said, a, a voodoo science, a pseudoscience, and nothing can be further from the truth. That's correct. All right, Rob, I hand back to you. Just needed to get that out of my system. No, that's great. That's great. Well, it just occurs to me, there's so many of these areas, it's not just homeopathy that's attacked. I mean, I, I can think of an example that I use in my regular life, ch chiropractic. You know, there, there are many doctors, many people, many smart, well-informed people that 
they just did offhand. They just, they've never tried chiropractic, won't try it and just completely discount it. It saved my life many times and made me feel great. Increased the quality of my life. Um, stop me from walking funny. I mean, I could give all kinds of examples and in homeopathy, I've used it in my life and my dog's life. So I can think of a couple occasions like my, my veterinarian has made a custom homeopathic post uh, vaccine when my dogs have been vaccinated. And that's a, some sort of detoxification uh, uh, thing. I can't prove that it's done anything. I mean, I'm just trusting my vet and my vet's incredible. But I can tell you that when I've given my dog things like Arnica, when he's limping, um, the symptoms go away. Um, yeah. he, you know, I'm not telling him what he's taking. He doesn't know what he's taking. Um, it's about as honest as you can get. I, all I know is he was limping one second. I dilute it in some water. He drinks it. And I usually throw a little olive oil in there. So he wants to drink it comes in contact with his mu mucosal membrane. And there you go. We've also used it actually a long time ago. I feel like I've used maybe like Dr. Dim is like sulfur for some skin issues. That sound like something. That's a, that's a major chronic constitutional remedy in homeopathy, meaning that it addresses chronic disease like skin allergies and itching. Whereas Arnica, I'm glad you brought that up. This is kind of to distinguish more addresses acute symptoms of disease like injuries or trauma. And um, with acute injuries and acute traumas and homeopathy, you don't need to be as precise as you have to be with more chronic ailments. And so with chronic disease, we have to really fine tune our remedies to match that symptom totality. Whereas in an injury or a trauma, Arnica, as well as you know several other common remedies are often used initially. And then the response is dramatic. And you know, for people that really want to see the power of homeopathy, it's to use it in those acute situations like injuries and trauma. And you know, the placebo effect goes right out the window when you when you see when you see their amazing responses. You know, I you know, I see these injuries on the basketball court, you know, with the NBA playoffs now, which I like to watch. And you know, people falling on the basketball floor, injuring their spinal their, their spinal cord and their and, and their knees. And I just wish they had homeopathic remedies in those in those locker rooms to give those players. They would recover so much more quickly than they would with just Western drugs. So what happens? Let's just use arnica as an example, because most people have heard of arnica. Or a lot of people have heard of arnica. I, what happens mechanically? You know, what's the mechanism that you know? Let's just bring it down into layman's terms. Like the, the body takes it in and says, Hey, you know, summon what, 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 what is the message that happens in the body? Well, I mean, again, the principle of like cures like, so Arnica, the plant in its toxic or poisonous form, you know, causes injury in healthy patients who would take it. And then in, in people or animals that have symptoms of Arnica poisoning, it would be where the remedy acts in a curative way when it's prepared homeopathically, in other words, where that substance is diluted and shaken, and that's called um, succussion, and it's diluted and shaken down to a very low molecular structure, in other words, below what's physically there on an energetic level. And it's at that level where it stimulates a healing response in the patient. And so, you know, it's, it's used and it's prepared and diluted. And it's it's so fascinating to me, even to this day, how the more diluted it is, the more powerful the substance. It's the opposite of Western medicine, where we're, we're dosing in milligrams and, and looking at toxic drugs. Homeopathic remedies, the more dilute the substance is, the more powerful the ability of the substance to heal. And so, you know, you get an acute trauma like or an injury where a patient has uh, or hit by a car or, or you know, a fall, and you give a remedy like Arnica, the response is often within seconds. It's just amazing. And that's with, again, this is acute prescribing. That's what makes me and others who, who, you know, study homeopathy for the first time believers when you see how rapidly a patient can respond to the correct homeopathic remedy in an acute situation. It's the chronic diseases, the skin allergies, the itching, the chronic diarrheas, the seizure cases, 
those cases are take much more time and patience to work through the layers of problems that those animals have. And then you have to be a lot more patient. But with acute disease, homeopathy works faster than any other drug or any other medicine. I, I used to work in an emergency clinic here in Flor South Florida where we would see, for example, heat strokes. And they would come into the clinic and, uh, you know, they'd have 107, 108 temperature and a bulldog, you know, that breed that oh. has problems breathing. And I would give a dose of the homeopathic remedy, Belladonna, in high potency. And you repeat it every few minutes. And by the time my technician would get the IV catheter in, the temperature was from 108 down to 102 before she even had a chance to get the IV fluids going. So wow. when we have these acute situations, homeopathy works unbelievably quickly and amazingly well. Wow. I mean, I had a case, you know, we were talking about Ian brought up, you know, case studies, but, you know, we clinically speaking, you know, your clinical experience is nothing that beats that in terms of efficacy. And I never forget, I had a case of a basset hound that came into the clinic that was paralyzed in its lower legs. It came into the conventional clinic. I was doing part-time traditional relief work at that time. And the animal came in totally paralyzed in its lower legs and uh, had no no deep pain. I was getting ready to write up the uh, transfer notes to the local neurologist where MRI and probable back surgery was going to be needed to save that animal's lower legs. And it had come on, paralysis come on suddenly. So it wasn't a, a chronic issue at that time. And I said, you know what, let's try a high potency of the homeopathic remedy, Nux Vomica. And we gave that animal a dose of Nux Vomica in high potency. My technician had already left the room and was getting ready to write up the instructions to get, you know, for the local, the directions to the local ER where the neurologist was. And we gave, I gave that remedy in a 10M potency, which is a very high potency. And within a minute, the animal started wiggling its toes and then it jumped off the table and ran out the door. And everybody was amazed. The client who had no background or knowledge of homeopathy and, you know, was just totally amazed. And I said, wow, you know, that's just something that wow. just never ceases to amaze me. The, the, you know, the, the tremendous response in an acute situation like that. And way, and obviously way less invasive and way less expensive than, I mean, why, why wouldn't you try this before you, you know, operate on a spine, you know, ten exactly. $20,000, right? Yeah, where surgeries aren't even uh, often effective, or no. if they are effective, you know, uh, usually a short time later, the spinal cord segments, a few vertebrae down, are diseased in the same way. So, you know, you're not going to keep operating on a dog repetitively. Wow. Yeah. No. Wow. Wow, it's amazing. And then you mentioned the, the what would you say, 10M, as in Mary? Yeah, 10M, yes. So, because I, I notice on, like, my Arnica, I I use Arnica Montana. I want to say it's, do I want to say it's 30 C? Is that right? Right, right. So what is that? Is that just the potency or is that the that's, that's energy? The, that's the strength of the medicine. Okay. And 30 C is diluted. One drop of the original plant, Arnica, is diluted in 99 drops of water 30 times. So in other words, you're, you know, if you did it like manually, you would take one drop of the of the plant extract, put it in 99 drops of water, shake it, and then put it put another drop of that solution in 99 drops of water, and do that 30 times. Okay. Now that's done now by machine, and so when you do it, if you think about it that way, and you think about it, Rob, how dilute that substance really is. That's why people in Western medicine say, "Oh my God, there's nothing physically there. There's nothing that can treat the patient." But it's the dilutional effect and the shaking, the shaking is important too, that imparts a tremendous energy of the substance into healing. And that's and so a 30 C is diluted one drop in 99 drops of water 30 times. A 10 M is even more dilute, much more dilute than that. It's one wow. drop of it's one drop of, of the original substance, in this case, Nux vomica, um, a poison. Um, it's one drop diluted. 99 times, 10 times. I mean, it's just amazing. And I guess, you know, I'm going to just ask one more question about energy or just follow one more thought. So the, would you call it succussion? Succussion, right. That's where you're shaking, shaking. Yeah. 
the, the, I, uh, I remember, gosh, this is 20 years ago when I first, a vet first gave me some homeopathy and she said, shake the bottle against, hit it against your shoulder like 20 times. Is that what, what, what I was doing? Right. You're, you're, you're imparting energy to the medicine. You're making it stronger. The more you shake it, the stronger it gets. So it's not just the dilution, which brings out the powerful healing ability of the substance. It's the shaking as well. That's very, very important. Wow. So that's called succussion. Yes. So, yeah, I'm so not doing that. that. All of that does sound like voodoo. But the <laughs> point is, we don't really understand how molecules and their their smaller particles actually work and and even what they are with quarks and all sorts of things so at the physics level this is something that we really have no knowledge of and to discount it by saying oh it couldn't possibly be because we don't understand it to my mind as a scientist is crazy it's just something that needs investigating not not thrown away and, and i think this is the important point if something is appearing to work and it is working and in this case it's constituting part of a healing practice where people feel better or animals feel better very quickly and actually physically are better it's absolutely if we can't we can't because we're not physicists investigated but we have to accept that this is a real phenomenon it's actually happening and just because we don't understand it, it doesn't mean we throw it away. And, and no. that's the crazy part about so many scientists. No, they're not, I don't call them scientists because they're not willing to have an open mind. They're really technicians who've been trained to be technicians who, have, who don't have an open mind. But we have to be willing to look at these things. And that's the important point. As veterinarians, as doctors, if something's working, we have to ask why. And not just discount this so-called placebo effect because even of in and of itself it's part of the healing process yeah so yeah. the placebo yeah. effect is an effect yeah that's right right but our animals aren't aware of placebo they're guardians with their observations you could say maybe that's a placebo but i don't know how you could look at a placebo when you see a, a basset hound with no deep pain present in its in its limbs <laughs> all of a sudden get off the table and run out the door and say hey there's nothing wrong with me i didn't you know i'm fine or or an animal who's in severe, you know, heat stroke or severe trauma, who responds so quickly to these medicines, where the reversing of the symptoms is just remarkably fast, and that's where you know people really want to experience homeopathy. It's in the world of acute prescribing and acute situations, whether it's acute digestive symptoms where an animal gets into the trash, or food poisoning, or there's a trauma or an injury. Those are the you know, the best places for somebody to really see the power of homeopathy and how placebo really plays no role in those situations. Of course, of course. Well, it occurs to me the, that this is all, you know, the, the, uh, the treating like with like is very similar to um, oriental medicine that's been around for thousands of years. I mean, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, you know eat uh, blood for the blood, heart for the heart, uh, liver for liver toning. I mean, it, it's very similar uh, philosophy. Right, right. I mean, and even the concept, not that it's the same. I mean, I don't want to open up a whole can of no. worms for the yeah. rest of our show, but vaccination, the idea of that is diluted amounts of, of viruses or bacteria that stimulate an immune response. That's more on a physical level. And what we're talking about homeopathically is on an energetic level. That's where I think people... When they can't see it, and I think Ian brought it up, like the world of physics where most of the particles aren't even, you know, they're not tangibly measurable in, with the human eye. And it's just to be able to appreciate that there can be healing at that level, at an energetic level, just like there can be on the biochemical level, even though energy is deeper. And when we go into the systems of energy medicine, that's where healing really occurs when we, with homeopathic remedies to treating chronic disease, we're lessening the susceptibility to future illness. That's really a, a novel term where, where Western medicine really, when it comes in with its strong antibiotics and steroids and chemotherapeutics, um, it's, it's not really making the life force or the chi of the patient stronger. If anything, it uh, often is weakening the patient. 
And future cancer is just as likely, if not more, in the Western medically treated patient. Whereas in homeopathically treated patient, our goals is to make the patient stronger, less susceptible to future illness, because we're in, we're enhancing the, the health of what's called the life force of the patient, which is the energy that governs the physical uh, functions of the body. And that's where that's where I think people get really uneasy about is, is that energy is where it's all at. And then, of course, you get into spirituality and and soul healing and all of that. But that's really the levels of healing that can occur with energy medicines like homeopathy. Oh, hey, this is Rob Ryan, founder of Gussie's Gut. There are two opportunities I'd like to share with you. Number one, if you're enjoying this video right now, wait until you see the ones we have coming up. I invite you to subscribe right now to our YouTube channel right here below. And number two, if you'd like your dog to have a delicious sample of fermented superfoods that was developed with Dr. Ian Billinghurst that you sprinkle on top of their food and support their healthy gut, healthy aging, and cover the gaps in their nutrition, then I'm inviting you right now to go to gussiesgut.com forward slash sample. So just hit the pause button here on this video, subscribe, and then visit the website. Thanks for watching. Back to the show. I think I think on that level, we don't understand the totality of the workings of the system. We right. have no idea, but we try and look at it, and we we try and look at say um, genes and, and genes being expressed, and then they produce a certain protein, and but and then this is part of a biochemical pathway. But there are literally hundreds of thousands of biochemical pathways all, all interreacting. And you pluck one string of one of the pathways and it, that, if you like, the energy of plucking that string affects everything else. So right. if somebody has tapped into this with homeopathy in the same way that the Chinese tapped into um, pain receptors and, and hormonal responses by sticking in needles at certain points and then observing the effects and then putting it together we don't understand how all that works but if it does work why not use it and that's yeah. the point isn't it if there's somebody trained in that area then that's what we should be using because we have to when i came out as a veterinarian we i literally came and this was in australia and really we weren't taught at that time um this scientific idea that all medicine had to be the same in fact we had a a leading veterinarian in australia who ran a postgraduate course his name was tom, tom hungerford and he said i want to know what you did i want to know how you did it and what the response was i don't care about the niceties of double blinds and all that he said if it works i want you to share it with your fellow veterinarian well to a large degree that has been lost in, in the um newsletter that he founded because today they all want to do double blinds and so on but to a degree it's still there and that is true healing and that's where we should be and and so obviously i don't know enough about homeopathy to practice it i mean you know things like arnica work on, on this acute level but if somebody like yourself and the pitcan institute has has actually looked into this at great depth and actually knows how to how to work this homeopathic machine then some then we should use it and to, yeah. it's crazy to say, oh, I'm not going to get better via that method. I'd rather use drugs that are going to give me all these side effects if I know that the homeopathic machine or the acupuncture machine or whatever actually can do the job. I don't care what the, the theorists say. We are here to heal. And right. Really, that's what it's all about. And we've really lost that vision of ourselves. Right. You know what killed it most, in my opinion? It's these business arm of the veterinary or well, the veterinary profession once i saw the business arm come in where you had to make so many dollars from each visit that's literally killed any meaningful interaction with patients to a large degree oh you're so right Ian. and and you know most of the in here in the states i mean so many the movement in conventional vet practices the buying up of practices by corporate veterinary medicine, um, big, huge, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that buy up the small animal practitioner, the old, 
you know, mon pa practitioner. And we really don't see that anymore. It's more huge business and how much you can generate and income that you can produce. And it's not about the true health of the patient or getting to know your patient. Absolutely and, not. Yeah. And it's like that in, you know, in our, in our field of medicine, in, in human medicine, of course. Yes. So it's, it's, it's a loss of touch of, 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 you know, really getting to know your patient. And, um, you know, it's, it, you're right about the double blind placebo model. I remember several years ago, um, Dr. Ron Schultz, who is an immunologist in the States here, um, you know, looked at the effects of parvo vaccine nosodes on preventing parvo disease in, in young puppies. And he was trying to apply the, and he acknowledged he was trying to apply the Western conventional model to studying what are called nosodes, which are diluted substances of the actual disease parvo and or, or developed from the you know the secretions of an animal who's been affected by parvo but you know it's it's been shown by clinical experience that parvo nosodes can work as effectively if not more effectively than the vaccine so a lot of my holistic clients who bring me in puppies we put them on a parvo nosode protocol and we don't see parvo virus in those animals isn't that wonderful? And yeah, yeah, without the side effects of the vaccines. Yeah, do they, vaccines, yeah. Do they tighter uh, for for parvo or? Well, how it works, Rob, is in a nutshell: is the the parvo nosode as an energy medicine itself comes in and almost like blocks the susceptibility to actually coming across with the real virus. So okay. it's an energetic concept, almost like if you if you think of like Pac Man. It, it, it like fills that space so that the parvovirus can't get in. Okay. And so and so it's an energy concept where these dil the diluted substance of parvo prepared homeopathically as a nosode actually blocks the entrance or blocks the susceptibility to the actual viral infection. So young puppies, you know, are, are not as prone to clinical disease, which obviously can be very serious in, in a puppy. Wow. What, and what they may, the question I then have, do they maintain that ability into adult life? Do they well, need repeated nose How that does that question, work? Ian. I, mean, I don't know if that's ever been studied, but, you know, the fact is, is that in, you know, in my experience over 30 years, you know, parvovirus infection, as is most acute viral infections, is most commonly in young puppies under a year of age in high stressful situations. So, you know, what we do in, in homeopathy land is we'll use these nosodes when animals are most susceptible to clinical disease. So after they're a year of age, we stop using parvo or distemper nosodes because we're not really seeing clinical disease in the clinic after that age. And so, or if an animal is exposed, their own immune system is able to handle it fine on, on their own. Which is really what we really want to do is strengthen right. that immune system to deal with it. That's, I mean, I mean, that's what the vaccine's attempting to do anyway, but you're doing it on a deeper level in a sense. That's exactly you're right. Actually working with the immune system to be just to become stronger. That's what I'm hearing anyway. And uh, if that's working, how brilliant is that? But the trouble is, Dr. Michael, there's no money in it. There's Not no money. Yeah. Pharmaceutical companies. And, and That's this, exactly this right. is the problem. And as a profession, we actually have to become more altruistic. How we do that, I don't know. I think the key is is you know you know it's it's you know it's sad, but the key is trying to get to the to the young veterinary student uh, before they're brainwashed into this into this way of being. And 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 as soon as you go to veterinary school. You know, right away in your traditional training, it's run by pharmaceutical companies, pet food industry, you know, the pet food conglomerates. And, you know, it's not really training us in energy medicine or homeopathy. So somehow we have to find a way to educate young veterinary students and young veterinarians on that. And, and you know, there's there's movement over the country to, you know, in, in veterinary school to sponsor training, either it's. Dr. Pitcairn's course or or acupuncture 
at the veterinary school level, in other words, through organizations and associations, and that's all we can really do. But it's a it's a huge it's a huge obstacle dealing with the Western medical, big pharma, you know, philosophy of medical training. It just is yeah. very. It's the Western medical model, the, the philosophy behind it. That's that's a huge system to change. It really is. And so, you know, we have to bring back, you know, the the naturopathic colleges somehow. I mean, back in the turn of the century, most of the medical hospitals in this country were homeopathic hospitals. It was only because of the rise of the AMA and the American Medical Association that that really you know, you know, squashed homeopathic teaching hospitals because it became more about money and greed than it did about the health of the patient or the animal. Yeah. I, um, in, in a lot of my lectures, particularly in the early days, I talked to the people about taking their animals in who were feeding raw. Not, this wasn't homeopathy, but it's a very similar situation. And saying so presenting these animals to their vet and saying, this is what happens when you feed real food. You actually start to heal the animal without drugs, without surgery, because you're actually putting them into their bodies what their body requires to be normal, healthy, and normally functioning. And that's gone on quite a bit. And I think we are gradually seeing a change. But, but this will come in many ways from the bottom up, in, I, I believe, that where if enough people are demanding that their profession has these skills, then this profession is going to have to look to it in a real way. So... I guess it's up to people like ourselves who are influencing through the web the people out there to become more interested in in actual healing as opposed to the use of drugs and, and, and so on. This is where the push has to come from. It has to come from the people at the ground level who have animals that are sick and are now saying, we don't want this anymore. So, no. so that's where we have to push it. Absolutely. And, you know, animals... I don't know if we'll get into it, but animals today are sicker than they ever were ever before, just like children. You know, more chronic disease, immune-mediated disease, cancer in younger and younger animals. And that's what kind of fueled my interest in homeopathy when I graduated from Penn back in the early 90s. And, you know, in my early training, I obviously was taught very well by my allopathically, by my medical, by my, by my teaching, educate by my education. And, you know, using drugs over and over again or surgical techniques was only band-aiding or what we call in homeopathy, palliating or suppressing the symptoms. But the patients weren't healthier. They were coming back quicker or with other side effects with the medications. And so with that, with decades of treating allopathically with drugs and steroids and antibiotics and strong surgical procedures and chemotherapeutics, we're seeing sicker patients at younger ages. I mean, the incidence of most chronic diseases is so much higher today than it was, I'm sure you can see, uh, over 30, 40 years ago. Absolutely. Where, you know, it's, it's, it's a sicker population. And so that's really what fueled my interest in, in looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah, but well, you have to be, um, being interested in energy medicine, you have to be... Uh, very interested in what's happening with all the cell phones everywhere and all the yeah. cell towers. And I mean, talk about, we're, I mean, we're just getting bombarded by, I mean, yes, there's more toxins in our environment, but when you start combining it with EMFs and, you know, the, all, all of this signal, you know, yeah, that adds another, another factor to it. Sure. EMFs and cell phones and, you know, what we're seeing at, at that level, that energy, bombardment of our of our life force of our chi is just is is wreaking havoc on our systems and makes it harder to respond to homeopathic remedies when Hahnemann the father of homeopathy was in practice we didn't he didn't have all of these obstacles to cure now there's tremendous obstacles to cure not just as you said and with our food supply and our environment and the chemtrails and the water and you know every other toxic insult um you know, we have it at that energetic level now. So that makes it even more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I think even um, getting outside, one of our problems is that so many dogs and people now are in high rise situations. They don't get outside. And there's just something very simple um, 
like getting out in the morning and looking at the sunshine, looking around, that in itself is powerful medicine. And, and that sounds ridiculous, but it is. It's powerful medicine because it sets all sorts of clocks off in our brain and, and melatonin happening and all sorts of things, which we don't really fully understand as yet. Yep. And in fact, this most of this stuff we don't have to understand. We just have to know if this works, let's use it. And one of those things is simply getting up and looking at the sun and or looking at the sunrise, for example. And this sort of thing is denied to people and animals today in our big cities and in the apartments and so on. So th there's something that people can do. They think about to get up and, and practice a bit of looking around it, looking at the early morning with their dogs and cats. Just that's so great you brought that up, Ian, because that's part of a holistic approach to health. It's it's sunlight, fresh air, exercise, good food, yes. you know, limiting the toxins and the drugs that we poison our animals and ourselves with and love. You know, it's it's just that's the basics of good health. And yes. we violate that or we don't allow access to, as you said, fresh air and sunshine, you know, that go and, and exercise that that takes away our health. There's so many obese animals nowadays with what, especially what they're eating and, you know, their, their fat cells and their liver and their kidneys are so overburdened with the toxins we're pumping into our animals, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year, we could spend, I'm sure you've had other shows on, you know, the, the, the toxic pesticides and vaccines and, and processed foods that, really contribute to ill health, but it goes back to basics. It's less is more, you know, if you want to break it down, homeopathy is a, a less is more medicine at, at an energetic mm -hmm. level at a very, at a very, um, you know, non-material level. It really good health comes down to that. When you look at it that way, there's, you guys just said a lot, uh, the, the, the sun is near infrared. The sun is there's nothing better than the sun uh, for vitamin D, melatonin, things you brought up. But that means also for ourselves, not being fully covered up, not being slathered with sunscreen and not wearing sunglasses and letting it into our eyes. I right, mean, yes. you know, there's a lot of interesting, you know, and then the, the other thought occurs to me that we have really allowed ourselves to, to be, uh, well, we've allowed ourselves to overcomplicate uh, health. And when you actually really get the benefit of talking to brilliant people and working with brilliant vets like yourself and Dr. Billinghurst, and you, the, the constant mantra that, that you all are trying to beat in our heads is that health is simple. Health is basic. And I'm sure that you come across people in your daily practice and phone consults that are trying, that are fighting you to keep it more complicated. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. I know that, that, that phone consults are a big part of what you do um, for people who don't have access to you locally. So can we talk about where your, like your customers are, your clients and, and how they come to you and how you work with them. And um, it's gotta be an interesting dance because you're probably coming. A lot of people are coming from traditional veterinary practices and coming to you, right? Right, right. Well, I brought up in the beginning of the program, um, you know, skin and ear issues, the number one probably health problem people bring their animals in for. Um, you know, in the traditional vet clinic, when you bring an animal in for an ear, quote unquote, infection, you're looking at making a slide of the, of the, of the bacteria or the yeast that are growing in the ears. You're looking under the microscope and then theoretically you're choosing a medication to combat a specific yeast or bacteria. Whereas in homeopathy land, what we're interested in is more the individual presentation of that disease, what the discharge looks like, whether there's an odor, whether it's the left ear or the right ear, what, what the animal's mental emotional status is at the time of the ear infection, other background symptoms that are occurring at that time. All of those symptoms go into the homeopathic treatment. So you know, I don't need to see a patient who comes into my, uh, who contacts my clinic, um, you know, for an ear infection, because it's a, a different way of looking at what that problem is. And so a person can describe that to me on the telephone. 
you know, what the discharge looks like, whether it's sensitive to touch, whether it feels better with warmer, cold compresses. These are all useful information of the homeopath. And, you know, granted, it's always best to see a patient. You get an idea of their personality and, and the guardians as well, which sometimes goes into the prescription. But, yeah. but you really, you know, can do this work long distance. My homeopath, I'm here in South Florida. He's up in Montreal and I speak to him periodically and he calls me and he asks about my symptoms. It's the symptoms that guide the treatment of the disease not a pathology, not a diagnosis. It's the symptoms of the patient that are the individual language of what's wrong in the body. Wow. You know, that's, you know, when you ask about how, you know, I often require, like if a client calls me from a long distance, I mean, I'll often strongly recommend that they have a physical exam, that they make sure that the heart and lungs sound good. There's no masses in the abdomen. There's no obstacles to cure, as we say in homeopathy. Um, so it's important that a that a guardian have a relationship with a local, you know, veterinarian. Of course, we have to train them to, you know, not fall victim to the pressures of a Western medical model of medicine, which is looking to, you know, give drugs and poisons to the patient. And so, but a physical exam is certainly important but not required or not mandatory for the type of work a homeopath does, you know. What do you think about all the vet advice and, well, health advice that's all over Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere? Well, I think it's, you know, it's done a lot of service to people where they don't have, you know, access to a local holistic or homeopathic veterinarian. Back when, Richard Pitcairn used to talk about when he was first doing this work back in the 70s and 80s. You know, of course, back then, you, you, you know, you didn't really have the technology that we have now. And he did see local patients in, in Oregon and, and actually uh, uh, did phone work back then. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, we have all of our, you know, modern tools. And it's helpful, Rob, but what happens is, is clients will often use that instead of seeing a local veterinarian or working with a with a veterinary trained holistic practitioner and we have to be careful because when we use energy systems of medicine or herbs or other even natural modalities we have to be familiar with the pathologies of the body and how the body tries to heal itself or 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 the effects of herbs or homeopathic remedies on the patient and when you don't have that training um, that can become sometimes a touchy ground where, you know, if there's a healing crisis or a homeopathic aggravation, someone not trained in 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 uh, Western, you know, in in the basics of medicine can do harm with the animal. And so that's what I have against some of these chat rooms and free advice, uh, you know, places on the Internet where it's and, and then people are looking for a quick fix. They're saying, you know, what's the treatment for my dog with skin and ear problems? What's the homeopathic remedy for seizures or for, you know, cancer? And it doesn't work that way. It's an individualized system of medicine uh, when you use homeopathy. And you also need to be trained where if the body tries to heal itself, if it goes awry, you need to be have a background on, on pathology and diseases, what we learn in medical school, in other words. Wow. So the, uh, let me switch my uh, camera here. I'm having a lot of thoughts here, but uh, I think um, I, I just have one question, Dr. Michael, to what extent do you use nutrition together with homeopathy? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, food is medicine, as you, as you obviously know, Ian, that's your expertise over many decades. And so I start with that, you know, Hippocrates, the father of medicine said, let food be thy medicine. And of course, food has its own energy. You know, everything we put in our bodies has an energy. Every mass on this planet, E equals MC squared, has an energy. And so, yeah, I, I recommend that clients feed a species appropriate. You know, I prefer a raw meat diet, a predatory diet. I know there's many models of doing that on the internet and through my colleagues. 
but I've always stuck to the basics of what a carnivore or an omnivore should be eating. And so I defer to people like yourself and uh, other experts. And, and there's so many resources out there with your materials and, and other nutritionally oriented veterinarians that I, I always recommend as part of that, a, a species appropriate diet. And as you mentioned earlier, often when you just change the diet of these animals to that, a lot of these chronic problems just go away and we don't need even homeopathic remedies to treat a lot of those patients because the body's wisdom of using the foods that it evolved to eat, you know, do is a tremendous asset to self-healing. That happens. I see, I see um, uh, food, proper food and homeopathy as having a tremendous synergy. Yeah, me Absolutely. too. Yeah, I mean, they're both working, you know, at a, at a very deep level in the patient. And yep. so, you know, I always encourage my clients, you know, to get the animals off the processed canned food, the dry kibble, even the, the novel versions, you know, back, I'm sure you remember, you know, decades ago, there really weren't, wasn't the tremendous expansion of natural diets, grain-free diets, uh, freeze-dried foods they're all well and good and they might be a little better than the processed commercial food, but they still don't hold a, hold a can of worms to what these animals should be eating, which is the basics of the, of the rotating predatory meat-based diet, as you can obviously attest to. Just real food that you can buy at the local supermarket by shopping around the edges. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's so interesting, you know, it's, and to draw back to what we were talking about earlier about the, about the you know tremendous you know big pharma and and you know the pet food conglomerates i can't it's so frustrating for me to hear and see my colleagues on the conventional side of things just recommend these processed kibbles and canned foods after not being trained at all on nutrition in medical school i mean i mean i got about 2 hours my third year of medical school on nutrition and i don't think that's changed today and no. so, you know, it's it's really tragic that, you know, the pet guardian is coming to the veterinarian for expertise on how animals should eat. And they're hardly getting that. They're just getting, you know, the spiel, you know, feed a processed commercial food, one of the major corporate based diets. Don't feed table food and your animal will be healthy. It's as That's far true. removed as, you know, as what possibly could be for, you know, proper health, the foundations of health. Well, but again, this vet, no. Go ahead. Vet, vet is trained to believe that nutrition is a dead issue. They don't have to worry about it. It's been solved, and anything they see is as a disease or a problem is totally unrelated to food. Just get on with the drugs and the mess, and that's the way veterinarians are trained. Sorry, Rob. No, no, not at all. I mean, we have to do a better job as consumers, too. I mean, this isn't just the job of the vets uh, to really understand that the system that, that has been created in the veterinary business, we, we touched upon this earlier, it occurs to me is uh, people aren't coming in for wellness visits on their own. They're only coming in because either the law or their vet has said, by law, you must get vaccinated at this interval. And it's bringing them back in the office. The other thing that brings people back in the office are these prescription diets, these so-called prescription diets. So you have to come in, you have to say hi to the lady behind the desk and, you know, hey, you know, did, let's let's check, you know, uh, Fido out. Or, and uh, um, by the way, Dr. Dim, uh, running joke between Dr. Billinghurst and myself is we always talk about how we use Fido for to, to refer to a dog, but we've never met a dog named Fido. Have you ever met a dog named uh -huh. Fido? No, no, but that's a good, that's a good generic uh, reference though. That's right, right, right. But we've got to do a better job because, because veterinarians, you know, have spent a ton of money to become a vet. They spend a ton of money to set up a practice and they have staff and they have to feed their families and, and, and make a living. And, you know, so they're looking for ways to have an actual business. And I appreciate that. And so I think we, we need to do a better job of bringing our, our animals in proactively and, you know, having them check. Um, 
I just want to go back super quick. Um, I just dawned on me. I remember with my dog, Owen, uh, he was, there was a time he was a yellow, yellow lab that had um, quite a bit of uh, skin issues, despite the fact that he was um, under a vet's care, a holistic vet's care his whole life, just a uh, raw fed diet, you know, uh, taught by uh, Ian himself. And anyway, he you know, it was constantly pawing at his ear and then it puffed up. And I, for, what does that call the hemio something? Hematoma. Hematoma. Yeah. And so it, it, I tried to bring him in quick enough and it, it got so bad that they said he's going to have to do that pin pricking and then, right. st- you know, cut it, cut the ear in, into the ears to let the blood out. Uh, and then they discovered some scarring um, inside a little bit inside the ear. So they told me it's going to be this big surgery and he could lose his hearing. I mean, it blew me away. I just, you know, I didn't see it coming. Right. And uh, so I called up my doctor who is an amazing integrative doctor. And he said, you know, I never forget this. I was actually in the airport when he called me back. So what's going on? I said, you know, look, I don't know if this is even worth the call, but you know, my, my doctor, uh, my veterinarian said, this is what Owen has to go through surgery. It's, it's a bad deal. I'm just looking for a way to get through, um, without it. So he said, well, you know, well, if it's, if it's in fact scar tissue, there is this homeopathic and I forgot the name of it. It was out of Germany. There is this homeopathic. If you put a few, one of the side effects of it is it's actually for some, I think it was for eyes for glaucoma or something, but one of the side effects they, they found is it, dissolve scar tissue. I said, dissolve scar tissue. What? That sounds ridiculous. I said, I'll try it. So I bought two little baby vials. I did it, I think two or three times a day. A week later, I took him into the vet who is holistic, integrative, awesome, open mind, wide open mind. Right. She said, she literally said to me, what ear was it? Oh, wow. That's amazing. And I couldn't believe when she asked that question, I could not believe it. And I won't even share the, the, the remedy, even if I look it up, because my only reason for sharing this is that, uh, there's no, there's zero financial interest and no other interest other than miracles can happen with all sorts of different types of medicines. And, uh, he never had to have that surgery. He was completely fine and it was complete fluke, but you know, it's, Again, phone consults and having a really good uh, you know, health team, both for yourself, but also for your, your animal. Gosh, it's so important. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, like I brought up a few minutes ago about like food be thy medicine, you know, I the word doctor in Latin, the original name of it, it means teacher. Yeah. So, you know, our job as clinicians <laughs> is to teach clients how to keep their animals healthy I'm at the purest definition of doctor. I am so, so glad you said that because I've for a long time been saying to my people when I do a consult and we do it by, via Zoom, which is marvelous. We could, it's almost like being in the same room. I am here to teach you how to feed your dog. That's what I'm, right. that's what I'm going to do. And then the dog will do the rest. A nutritional consultation. And yeah, we, that's it. And, and interestingly, I started my career, I, I did ag science before I did vet science. And uh, then I had a career as a teacher at, at high school level for four or five years. So yes, this this has been my constant life uh, as a vet to be a teacher. So, so how true is that? I wasn't aware of that. So thank right. you. For- yeah, no, that's the, what in Latin, what doctor means. And so- Never, never studied Latin. <laughs> yeah. uh, a deficiency in my education. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, and so when people contact the holistic veterinarian, it's, you know, if they're coming from conventional training, conventional clinics, they're so used to this, the, the charges of the, of the visit being minor being the exam and then the rest of it being diagnostics, expensive diagnostics, and then expensive drug treatments. Whereas the whole, the holistic practitioner, the homeopathic veterinarians charging for their time and getting to know the patient. And that takes yeah. an adjustment too with clients that come, well, what am I paying for? I'm not paying for anything tangible that I can you know, measure. 
And so that's another challenge to the holistic practitioner is what we're charging for our time for, for our expertise. And so, you know, we want to be fair to the, to our clients, but at the same time, it takes some education because people are often not, you know, they're used to that Western model of, of medicine. Well, I finished my consults up with now. Have you understood and have you any questions? Because Always ask if you have, right. I always find that's helpful. Always yes. ask if they have any questions. They have any questions. Actually, that's all the way through. But yes, yeah, so it's it's such a teaching model. And in fact, I took the same thing with my staff. I The whole time we were with staff, we were, I was teaching them. So if somebody had to move away and, and out of the another to another area they always found a job because they were such good staff they, they understood what was going on wow. my staff was always in demand well you trained them well right yes, i trained them yeah and, and it wasn't for any other reason that i wanted them to know what I, what was going on so so they could assist in what i was doing it was wonderful well it's it's the it's your knowledge Ian. it's the knowledge is power and so yes. it's it's not just you know the the western model of just a quick exam and then as i said you know diagnostics and drugs and surgery and then people are leaving with several hundred dollar bills and their animals are hardly any healthier that's exactly right or not healthier at all or actually worse but we're charging you anyway right right well it's also you know that same thing we we keep touching on this which is there's the responsibility of the vet and the responsibility of the client the customer and it occurs to me like most of my interactions with my veterinarians have been social and relationship building while i'm there for a very specific purpose i want to get to know them i want them to get to know me i mean my current vet now it's bizarre like most of our conversation is Probably ninety five percent of our conversation is on current events and politics. We enjoy <laughs> we enjoy talking about it with each other, and it's real or or his hobbies, woodworking and music and things we have in common. Um, and then that five percent sliver because he's so good, he'll just he'll go right to it. He'll look at him while he while we're talking, and he'll say, "So what's your concern?" Boom, goes right to it. And so you know, I don't a I don't ever ask my you know, well, well, gee, what, why did I get, why did I get charged this amount of money when 5% of it was, no, 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 that's not, that's not how I see things. I want a relationship and I want the, the person caring for my dog or, or pets to know me well enough and know what I, what it is, you know, where I'm coming from. Uh, I just think we have to, we have to do a better job of being connected to people and, and especially important people in our lives and people who care for us and care for our loved ones, including our animals. Those are important relationships in our lives. You know, oh, absolutely. These, and, and you brought up, an, action. brought up an excellent point, Rob, and so much of um, the, the guardian's perspective and even healthcare challenges or issues go into what's going on with the animal. And some of my colleagues actually homeopathically treat the guardian as well as the animal. So there's that interconnection that's so important to understand too. And sometimes I find that when I'm treating an animal, if I don't address some of the issues with the guardian, that's an obstacle to cure of the patient. So there's it's it's all a an inter an integrative functioning system, you know, guardian, veterinarian, animal. Well, you have to wow. know what that guardian can and can't do. And you have to tailor the treatment to allow them to do what they can do. So it really is a very personalized situation with a vet. Vets have to understand people, they have to understand animal medicine and how the body works at this so-called natural level. And right. that takes a well, lot Rob, brought up, Rob brought up a good point earlier in the beginning of the show, um, how we have to honor where everybody is at. So yes. I get perspectives of clients where they call me and sometimes they, their knowledge of holistic medicine, homeopathy is minimal. And so if they're feeding commercial food, I have to broach that topic very, sometimes very delicately. Yes. And, um, you know, sometimes they, they're going to move from commercial food to, as I mentioned, sometimes the, the bridge freeze dried, less processed, and then eventually hopefully to a raw diet. And yep. so we have to honor that 
everybody's at a different point on their healing journey. And we have to honor where each person is at in treating that animal. We don't want to become confrontational and say, your animal has to do it this way or, or yeah. things are going to cave in. But it's, it's, a, it's an honoring process. It's looking at each person, each animal as an individual. Yeah. Well, there's no point in prescribing something that somebody's not going to do on a sustained basis. I mean, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been amazing. This time has flown by. We've been at this an hour, Michael. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. Wow. I, I, I feel like uh, we definitely have to do this again. Um, I hope soon. And we'll pick we'll pick up this conversation where we left off. But where I want to do now is I want to go over where people can find you. So we've been putting up your website, drdim.com, D-Y-M.com. Right. If you're listening to this only and not watching it. And then uh, you've got an amazing show yourself, right? Yeah. Each Wednesday, um, I do a program um, with a local excellent uh, nutritional guru, as I call him, Bill Pachucky. Um, he has a wonderful store down here in Pompano where he he has wonderful diets, you know, species appropriate raw diets that he sends locally and all over the country. So we do a weekly radio program on iHeartRadio every Wednesday evening, and it's sponsored by the the Pet Health Cafe, and uh, we we have an integrative fun show every Wednesday evening at eight o'clock. So anybody who's listening on iHeartRadio. That's great. And it's, and it's called pet, uh, My Paleo Pet, right? Well, my Paleo Pet, exactly. Yep, yep. But you can just you can find it at uh, it's really easy to find at PetHealthCafe.com. That's right. And you know we have been having this show for a couple of years now. We it's enjoyable. Each week we do a different topic on holistic, you know, care from diet to nutrition to toxicity to you know different healthcare topics, homeopathy. And so it's a lot of fun and, you know, we, it's, it's gets good reception and it's a service we provide and I really, we really enjoy it. I love that. Well, that's great. Education is where it's at. Yep. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure and I'll put a link to Pit Karn's, uh website where you can find a Pit Karn educated home homeopathic uh, veterinarian uh, in your area. Um, and you certainly can ring up Dr. Dim, uh, just go to his website, schedule an appointment with him. I highly recommend it. It was really great to spend the time with you today. It really, I really enjoyed it. It was fun interacting with you guys. I, I enjoyed it. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and, uh, we'll leave it there. And hopefully next time we'll, uh, we'll take, we'll pick up this conversation with Dr. Dim where we left off. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.